give a bit of introduction. We're here to talk about food preservation and how that can support um, food security and, and I think most importantly, food sovereignty. I, I know I've heard that a few times this weekend, the importance of food sovereignty. And, and if you're not too familiar, my understanding at least is that that um, gives people more of a choice with their food and not just you know being handed a fish but being taught how to fish and they can continue to provide for themselves. Um, and so uh, this is Emma Burke. She um, is the market manager. Yeah. Market manager of Towns uh, Harvest Garden here in Bozeman and at MSU. Um, and I'm Amelia Libertor. I'm on the, well, I was on the board of Arrow um, and I've just completed my term. So I'm uh, on to other things. But I guess today I'm still on the board. So um, yeah, did you like to say some more about food preservation? Um, yeah, so I think you got it pretty on the nose with the importance of um, food preservation and food storage in terms of um, food access and food security. Um, a lot of those people that are food insecure in this country do rely on emergency food supplementation, so um, a lot of those foods are shelf um, stable. But there's also a really great opportunity for um, people if they do have access to fresh vegetables or fruits, which sometimes that they do at food banks, um, they can store those vegetables um, so they can enjoy them for a longer period of time. And so today I thought it would just be really um, fun and helpful maybe if we all um, shared some uh, techniques and ways that we like to store and process our food. Because um, there's so many things you can do and so many foods that you, you, can, you can process. Um, so we brought some examples here today of um, canned foods and foods that uh, just store well on their own. Um, you can also ferment foods and freeze foods. Um, you can freeze dry foods. Uh, there's just, I mean, the options are almost unlimited. So mm -hmm. yeah, if we all just wanted to like go around and maybe like say something about what we like to do, or if anyone has questions about ideas, that would be good too. And I'll just say, I brought notebooks if anyone wants to create like a, since we, we wanted to make this a hands-on workshop, but unfortunately on campus we can't handle our own food yeah. um, <laughs> or you know, create food to be consumed. So if you want to take a notebook and make this as like your food fermentation, you know, recipe book or journal or take notes in it for this session specifically, you can. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so I think also another important piece is the skill sharing and skill, you know, development um, and preserving like the tradition of, of, um, of preserving food <laughs> and, and uh, in terms of season extensions for us up in Montana we don't have a very long growing season so we can't be growing our tomatoes in December and um, making sure that we have those fresh nutritious vegetables uh, year round um, instead of shipping them up from, from faraway places um, or, or just to supplement you know it even makes a big difference to you know, put away some food so you're not always buying at the grocery store. It can be really cost effective. And I, and I know we've been, some people have been talking about the loss of um, skills in cooking and, and especially food preserving. I didn't grow up preserving food at all at home. Um, maybe a little bit of drying or freezing, but we really were shopping at the grocery store year round, even though we did have a garden um, some years. And so food preservation has been a recent thing for me to look, get into and, and research and learn. And it can be kind of scary, like, you know, can, there's a lot of, like, when I start Googling canning, everyone's like, oh, be careful of botulism, like, if you do it incorrectly, you can, you know, make yourself very, or others very sick. So, um, I found it intimidating to, to enter, but um, the more I talk to people about it and the more I learn, it, it becomes a very, you know, like you were saying, there's so many ways to do it, it's a very flexible art form, and you can kind of find the ways that you like to do it best and, and create your own recipes um, with a little bit of practice. So one thing I've been doing this year is um, canning a lot of tomatoes. <laughs> I've been working at Harlequin Produce this year, and so I end up with crates and crates of tomatoes that aren't good enough for market, but they're you know, plenty good enough to put in a jar. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just that's been my project this year is um, tomatoes. Do you want to uh, introduce yourself or share yeah, anything sure. about your? <laughs> um, my name is Sky. Um, I haven't been doing a whole lot of food preservation. I did take a canning class, which is really interesting. And so tasty and we did it as like a community project kind of thing. So that really cut down on labor, but I'm interested in trying dehydrating. I live in a van and I don't have electricity. So I'm interested in like solar dehydrating and checking that out. Sweet. 
Well, I'm John, I'm from Helena, and I'm neither a gardener nor a food preserver person. Um, the reason I'm here, my, my career has been in wildlife management, but the reason I'm here is because my wife and I, after I retire in December, we're joining the Peace Corps and I'm going to Tanzania, and I'm going to be doing sustainable agriculture work over there. <laughs> Other than having worked on a ranch for, you know, uh, uh, a year or so, I don't know very much about agriculture or sustainable agriculture, so I'm, I'm here just to learn, and I, I think obviously this kind of fits in with sustainable agriculture. I don't don't know where we're going to be assigned in Tanzania, so I don't know the climate, and I don't know any of that kind of stuff, but I suspect that in many cases it might be just small little plots that people have that they want to grow on. I, I don't think Tanzania has the large corporate agriculture like we have with GMO huge fields of wheat and that kind of thing, so I, I think it's probably going to be small community-based things that I'll be working with, so I'm just here as a sponsor to learn. I also don't have a lot of experience with preserving, but I've just recently started um, my first SCOBY to make kombucha, and so that's kind of like started to push me down into getting into fermenting and possibly making kimchi and things like that. So I definitely am just excited about learning about different techniques. So I just have a bunch of cork boards that I hang up in my kitchen. And um, if I buy herbs at the store, you could just dry your excess or if you have friends with gardens or your own, it's just really easy to hang it up and put it in a jar and have tea or spices for the rest of the year. And you can get a lot of spices out of a little. Yeah, it's a good flavor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, I do a lot of drying and freezing, and I make a lot of kombucha. So I like, I'm starting canning now. It's my next project. I'm interested to see where that goes. I had plans to make chutney out of some of our plums that grow on our tree this year, but I didn't get around to it. I need, I need a little bit of a kickstart. It is a very time-consuming process, is what I've been learning. It's like it's many hours in the kitchen sometimes, like for canning especially. But yeah, you can get it down. I had a bunch of strawberries one time, and I could jar, can, and jar in 45 minutes. Mm. Yeah, you know, it was like, go. Um, one of the things that we have is we've got a couple of commercial kitchens that people can rent by the hour in Missoula. Yeah, and we introduce yourself then? Yeah, Anne from Moonlight Kitchens. And um, we have two commercial kitchens and a workspace and storage. Um, but we've had people who want to do solar drying and that's a real challenge for the health department um, because it's, it's outside. How do you keep pests out? How do you keep it clean? You have to get it from the solar dryer into the facility that where you're going to package it. And that transition is, according to health department, fraught with danger. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if anybody wants to design a solar dryer, that would meet the health department regulations, I think there's a market. I'm Brendan. I'm personally interested in sustainable ag. I would like to get more into permaculture and canning would be a great way to store a lot of what I produce. I was a Peace Corps volunteer with sustainable ag and agroforestry and if you want to talk more after this, I'd be happy to share my experience with you. Um, but this is a great technique that you probably won't learn there. And so to bring this forward would be very innovative and helpful there. So kudos to you for being here. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking forward to seeing what you guys have to offer and share. Happy to learn. Uh, my name's Wes, and I come from a farm ranch background and I work with Kristen and Emma over here at Towns Harvest and grew up canning and freezing. Uh, I got really distinct memories of my mom getting like 30 dozen corn from the farmer and getting it delivered in a big pickup truck and that would be our next two days of just husking and freezing corn. Um, I've been doing some canning a lot with my wife over the past couple of years but I think going forward I'd like to find out more about drying and curing meat. 
it's not something you hear a lot about or that's not as prevalent in <coughs> practice as canning and drying. Hey everyone, I'm Mary. Um, I, don't, I don't have a lot of expertise around this, honestly. Uh, I'm here to support the students um, and learn from them. Um, I love good food, but frankly, I, at this point in my life, the time that I have towards food preservation is pretty limited, but um, I'm also committed to minimizing my personal food waste, so yeah, I feel like I'm at this tension point where I'm not doing enough around food preservation. I don't know where the time's going to come from. So. My name is Diana, and currently we're dealing with harvest with freezing, drying, fermenting, but we have a greenhouse and a root cellar is going to be completed within the year. And so I have questions about, you know, that uh, approach because you're not using uh, a whole lot of technology or carbon to make that work. But I know from uh, some of the elders that I've uh, visited their root cellars that you're supposed to store certain fruits and certain vegetables above or below one another because of the gases that they output when they're in storage. I'd like to know more about that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I don't think I've heard of that before. Gases coming out of the <laughs> vegetables it makes sense, I guess, but. Yeah, so you shouldn't like store like apples or plums with like your potatoes or something oh, that would okay. like sprout yeah. or do that, so. uh -huh. yeah. Good to know. <laughs> So our ancestors stored their food underground, so I'd like to learn more about that. Mm -hmm. And good point about energy efficiency too, I mean, yeah. you just, and time, you just yeah. Yeah. stick it in there. The, the thing I love to do is dry herbs because it's a sensual experience from the get-go, from the cutting to, you know, the, the drying to, the, you know, disassembling and crushing, it's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And to have your own herbs in your you know, your culinary uh, pantry for the rest of the winter is wonderful. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm Kate, and I live here in the Gallatin Valley. Um, here most personally because I have three apple trees and friends with plum trees, and usually go out and get my trip cherries and the whole yards. And so I literally have no space left in my freezer right now because all of my old Talenti containers have been filled with amazing <laughs> sauces and berries. <laughs> and I, there's sort of a limit to what my tiny little refrigerator freezer can hold. Mm -hmm. um, but I do come from a long line of farmers, um, <coughs> cooks, and I remember as a child my mother canning and my mother and my aunt in the kitchen for like days on end and then they swore they would never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Maddie, and uh, this year I really did the first batch of canning that I've ever done, and I think I'm most curious about flavors, because I got really eager and opened one of mine already, one of my pickles, and the flavors are a little off. <laughs> <laughs> Learning about how to make them taste really good. <laughs> My name's Gilly, and I also am not really experienced in canning, but I'd really like to learn more about it. I think I also had like a fear about botulism and everything, because everyone was like, mm -hmm. be concerned. I tried to make jams, and it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'd just like to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, my name's Allison. I'm an SFBS student. Um, I grew up doing some canning, like a lot of like jams and jellies, and like occasional like sauces. Um, and so I have a little bit of experience doing that, but then, you know, like, as I get older, I experimented more like with fermentation, and like I had an older neighbor who was, their whole family is really um, into like preservation, and they have a huge like one acre garden. And so he taught me a lot about like making like sauerkraut in like bulk crocks, you know, mm -hmm. to store in their root cellar. Um, and like you know having like cider parties where we go out in the orchard and bring all the apples we can find like in the neighborhood and like just make cider all day and like get really sick because you drink too much of it um, <laughs> so yeah i think like the community part of it is really important because no like like a couple people have mentioned like no one wants to spend all day in the kitchen by themselves like canning 40 boxes of tomatoes um and so i think yeah like the community aspect is really important just having like we were talking about in our last workshop like work parties and everyone gets something and everyone works and it's all done and it's fun and it's not just like drudgery so mm -hmm. 
My name is Bob Quinn. I live in Big Sandy, 300 miles north of here, and I'm recently at a time in my life where I'm starting to have more time, and that's my goal. And um, the last few years, my goal has been to grow everything I eat and try to eat everything I grow. Which mm. I grow more than I can eat, of course. But, um, <laughs> have that kind of variety. And I'm up to probably 85, more than 85 percent of what I eat nice. now. It's, it's from our farm wow. um, and things that we grow. I, I have a great um, a root cellar I had a lot of success with. Um, we have a little um, white mold that destroys my um, shelving. And I, maybe people have some ideas about how to help with that. I, um, my daughter makes vinegar. Um, it's not always successful, so if anybody has any expertise on that, I'd be very interested. We make sauerkraut too, and um, yeah, mostly preserve my food with the root cellar. Um, the squash and everything goes into and onions into dry uh, into my garage where it's kept above freezing but uh, much warmer and drier than the root cellar and the you know, freezer is full of just the vegetables just popped in as they are mostly. Uh, cider, we freeze our cider. Um, I don't do much drying, my daughter does and um, I'm here just to get <coughs> new ideas because I always learn wherever I go. It's the fun part. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Um, I'm Allie. I like to ferment and pickle. I would love to learn more about canning. And I'm doing my first season of vinegar. Oh, oh okay. Did we have it then? Yeah, sure. I'm Robin. Um, I've never fermented anything before. I just moved from California like less than a month ago, and I'm very new to the field of sustainability. So I'm just here to listen and absorb everything. Um, I, I guess I have done a little bit of, um, I used to make jam from like blackberries that we would just pick around my house in California, but that's my only relevant experience. Thank you. Um, my name is Kay, I'm coming from Butte, but I've only been in Montana for a year. Um, I actually grew up in the Philippines in a rather rural area, so I'm not familiar growing up with canning and with preserving foods. Um, but before Montana, I lived in New England, and while I was there, I kind of fell in love with wild plants, so I did a lot of drying of herbs, uh, made some tinctures with gold thread and some other medicinal plants. Um, jams, uh, made a jam out of some currants um, this summer, um, and crab apples in the past, but really looking forward to learning more about this. I'm Japanese as well, so like my favorite flavor palette, like really love like fermented tastes, but just really don't know a lot about the skills of how to create that. So looking forward to learning from all of you. Okay. Hi, I'm Hadley. Um, I'm from Southern Idaho. Um, I've been here in Bozeman for four years, getting my degree in agroecology. Uh, and I've dabbled various degrees in most of these things. I'm especially passionate about fermentation um, and especially about cheese making. That's kind of what I love to do, but I love all aspects of fermentation and lacto-fermented pickling. Um, I really, what Allison said about the community aspect uh, really resonates with me. One fun project we finally got to do this year, we've had an apple tree in our backyard that produces every other year and every year I uh, really want to do something with all these apples and then you know I'm in school and time gets away from me and I don't and finally all of my friends got together and found our one friend that bought um, an antique apple press and we all pressed our stuff together and he's making cider so that's something I'm really excited to see how that turns out and learn more from him about what he's what he's doing with that never, never tried that so I'm uh, Max, I'm from Helena. <coughs> I can't I, see you, Max. I'm Max, I'm from Helena. I've uh, started making sauerkraut, I've done some jelly beans, not every year. Um, I'm getting interested in tinctures. Um, I like that, and so I'd like to learn more the array of things you can do with tinctures. Um, I make pesto and pizza. I had one year where the sauerkraut didn't work, I did too much salt. So I'm putting that really salty sauce out of my soups, which works out great. Uh, <laughs> salad is difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Madison. Um, I guess I have a hodgepodge of experience with preserving and canning, kind of both at the farm level and then on the individual level, but I don't feel like I've ever really stuck with one 
strategy of preservation and I think similar to like Mary's point, I really want to again close the loop on my food waste and being able to utilize fully everything that I have um, and I want it to become more ingrained in kind of the preparation and cooking and then the you know the preserving aspect of that the whole system. I'm Kristen Ketchmar, as Wes mentioned, I work with Emma and Wes and a couple other people at Towns Harvest, and this is my second year of doing quite a bit of food preservation. Um, last year I did mostly freezing and some uh, experimentation with sun drying in an oven, which is uh, not the easiest, it didn't go super well, but uh, definitely dehydration's a little bit more consistent. Um, and then this year I really got into canning. Uh, I tried, there's one jar here, I, of confit, which is just for canning and oil. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see how it works, <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, and yeah, then relying on storage vegetables that can just hang out in my pantry and do well in cool, dry environments. Um, I like the tincture thing and making vinegars. I haven't experimented with either of those, but that sounds really cool. Um, I have been doing sauerkraut and kimchi for the last couple years. I'm finally getting my kimchi recipe down, which is really exciting because the flavor was not great the first couple times I made it. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited. It's cool to hear all of your experiences and um, I'm excited to learn. Um, so I just wanted to bring up the community piece. So, like, I think that's really interesting that you know, we all have these endeavors and projects and things that we want to get done, um, whether it's in terms of policy or our work, and then we come home and we still have things that we want to do um, that might seem overwhelming. And so um, doing them together, finding a, a community kitchen or someone with a house and a kitchen big enough to take on a big project um, is definitely a, a great way to build community in the home, I think. And, and with friends and, and sharing the, the knowledge. So. Yeah, one of the funnest things we did at Town Service Garden this season, I think, was the last one of the last days we were there. We all got together and um, had a canning party, and we canned um, uh, pickles, and um, we made applesauce, which was um, really great to like have all of us there because um, we were able to like bring our like knowledge and our, our tools together to like make it a lot faster than any of us could have done it by ourselves. I think and. We also made a lot of pesto, like a lot of pesto. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and that I think is like a great way to like preserve fresh basil, and then you can freeze it, um, which is great because like that's one thing I really miss in the winter time is like fresh herbs. And stuff. Yes. Is there any other way of preserving basil without it going bad? Um, I don't know. You could, yeah, you could try it. We we were like. Wondering about that. That's why we made so pasta. I tried to dry it, and it just turns black. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've heard of people putting it in like ice cube trays with olive oil. Yeah, mm -hmm. and just freezing it. It's like grind, crush it, or grind it up. Dry it first, or uh, like fresh. You just like chop it up. Mm -hmm. I've never done it, but um, it works. We well. done it. Well. I use sapphire oil. Of course. But you have to put. Um, a cellophane or something over the top, it will it will darken on the top too. But the ice cream shoes, trays are perfect because you can just pop them out and use them one at a time. Or you pop them out ahead, put them in a Ziploc, and then the ice cube trays are available. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. so. And they don't turn black. In the Ziploc? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. That's good. So it's exposure to air that yeah. Yeah. turns it black? I usually <laughs> double bag it in freezer bags. Mm -hmm. But there's not, I don't think you're going to lose a ton of Flavor. It's just oxidation. Mm -hmm. As long as it's you know, it's just like on the surface and it's kept cold. So it's an ugly vegetable. Yeah. Situation. <laughs> yeah. It's just more of an ugly vegetable situation. Yeah. Maybe drying it more quickly would. I don't know. I haven't tried drying basil. Yeah. Yeah. How are you drying it? Mm -hmm. uh, just air drying. I oh, haven't tried okay. a food dryer. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Do that. So yeah. That'd be something to try. Yeah, I guess. I think um, in terms of the time efficiency, I know that a lot of us are always short on time and um, 
trying, I've, I've been doing a little bit of dehydrating because it's not my dehydrator, but it's in my house. And so that can be a great way to save time is that you're, you just, you, you know, you do a little bit of prep, stick it in the dehydrator, and, and it goes for like 10 hours or something, you know, overnight. And in the morning you have something that you can just sweep into a Ziploc or, or uh, you know, store in a jar or something. So that, that's been another like, favorite of mine lately. Yeah. So we have an example of that this year. I um, borrowed Max dehydrator and sun dried out. I did like three full dehydrators worth of um, these sun boiled tomatoes that are delicious and awesome, and the flavor really gets preserved when you sun dry them. When you dry them. Um, but yeah, then they're just you can just leave them in a Ziploc bag and. They're totally fine. It does take quite a bit of time because they have a lot of moisture. It took about 12 to 15 hours per batch. But like you just leave it overnight. You don't really have to mess with it at all, which is really nice. And yes. do you do any prep beforehand or just? Cutting them all in half. Oh. It took about, I would say it spent two and a half hours total for all the batches, just slicing mm -hmm. tomatoes. But in a community situation, <laughs> that would not take nearly as long. Yeah. Is there a specific brand of dehydrator that people have found to be most effective? The one that someone lets you borrow? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't remember the brand. Yeah. But it's got 10 racks. So 10 racks. Know, oh, that's fill up the racks. And, and, oh, yeah. It's, and it's, it's, but it's really um, narrow. You know? yeah. So you'd have, so like with apple, we did apple slices. Mm -hmm. You had to slice them like pretty thin mm -hmm. to. To get all ten racks to fit so in. So when you talk about sun dry, you're not really talking about putting in the sun with that kind of yeah, machine. Yeah, uh, just electric. Putting outside where there's lots of dry. Air. It's like a dehydrator. Electric just dehydrator. Yeah. yeah. And you can you can do meat like that too. Like I've made jerky in a dehydrator before, and it was really good. Mm -hmm. um, so that's One of the temptations with tomatoes is to crank up the heat, but you're losing the nutrition when you do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if it you know I've done tomatoes in a warming drawer, like for. Uh, uh, bakery items and I made some screens out of stainless steel screen material which you can buy from construction supply places like in Missoula Axman has it um, and it does take a long time but I was I had to remember to leave the drawer open a little bit to let the steam escape um, and it probably took two days but I could layer up the shelves and got, you know, the temperature sat at probably about 110 max. I, yeah, I did find that the first batch, um, we did pretty hot, and it didn't, it took the shortest amount of time, but they were not nearly as good as the second, the second and third batches. Um, I did it at a low temperature for quite a bit longer, and yeah, they come out much tastier. Mm -hmm. It's worth it for the time, time-wise. Are those totally, totally dry, or is there a little yeah, bit of moisture I mean, left in there that you'd have to worry about don't get, yeah. keeping them? So, through. I don't know if you want to, not if anyone wants to eat it, it, but you could pass it around to him. Don't tell Dustin. Yeah. 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 <laughs> don't, don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a little bit of Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, I don't know exactly how. It's enough that it's not going to mold, but mm, okay. they have mm. some chewiness to them. Mm -hmm. Now he just ate the one that we got passed around. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can just come fill the bag, oh, I guess. Okay. <laughs> I have a question for those of you that have good experience with um, a sauerkraut. I just started uh, using the Crocs with the airtight lid with the water seal, mm -hmm. which I love. It really, there's no waste at the top. It was always molded on me. But I'm wondering about the temperature as far as um, fermentation. I've been putting them in my root cellar. It's about 50 degrees. Some friends of mine leave them on their kitchen table at 70. Uh, I know that goes faster, but um, mm -hmm. does anyone have any suggestions or experience about the right temperature, or does it make it that much difference? My mom makes a lot of sauerkraut, and depending on the time of year, she like puts it in different places in the house. So, like in the winter time, she can keep it in the kitchen pantry, but like in like warmer times, she'll put it in uh, this spare bedroom that like doesn't have heat going to it and like put it in the closet. But um, uh, my mom also uses, she like, the Crocs can be kind of expensive. Um, so if like that's a barrier for you, she uses a, like a five gallon paint bucket and she just puts a cabbage in there and then she puts like a plate that fits perfectly in the bucket and then like weighs it down. Mm -hmm. And that works really well too, so. Um, but yeah, with the temperature thing, I think 
you just have to, I think it helps a lot if like your cabbage is fully submerged, then you don't have to worry about it mm. as much as like with the mold or something. But um, yeah, I, from what I read online, you can you can vary the temperature and it just takes different amounts of time. Mm. But I think it would, that would depend on um, what flavor you like too and, and how fermented you want it to be. So, yeah. Yeah, I, when I started doing a bottle, I found they said like two or three weeks at around 70. Mm -hmm. Then I, the first time I did it, I just did the refrigerator thing. After three weeks, I stuck it in the refrigerator. It's supposed to last six months in mm -hmm. the jar. But when I started doing Crocs, once you've had that first, you know, get it going, I think you can probably go in a cooler place. Mm -hmm. It'd probably go all winter or something. Mm -hmm. but then you have to be able to get there where you can put that water, keep, keep that water from yeah. evaporating away. Well, there's uh, the two Mindy's about 96%, so it almost never evaporates. Yeah. I think it depends on how long you want it to last. Because if you're doing like a big batch of it and you want it to last all season, you know, like it's eight mixture, months, yeah. yeah, then you would want to keep it where it's colder. Yeah. So I think it depends on like your goal for the batch that you have. Mm -hmm. And if your concern is like keeping it for a long time too, um, you can can it, which cooks it a little bit and like probably kills some of the beneficial bacteria in it. But you, I mean, you could also do that in mm -hmm. this I really like the point about tinctures. There, you guys talked about a lot of things that I did not think about. I was like, all right, canning, dehydrating, freezing. Um, but I, I like the point that you can turn your food into medicine and and bring it into this like concentrated. I've never tried it. I do a lot of tincturing. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any like easy recipes or? Honestly, it's pretty from? simple. You just need your herbs and then super high proof alcohol, and then it's gonna take you a long amount of time. You can keep the herbs in there. You can filter it out. Just know with tinctures, they're like super potent. I take some almost every day, but it's like half a teaspoon. Yeah. Like a dropper. So how long does it take to get done? Um, I would say you don't want to filter the herbs out before two months. Like you want to leave it in there. For a while for sure yeah and sometimes you with some stuff you might want to use Everclear with other stuff you just want to use like the highest percentage vodka that you can find so do you crush the herbs or tear them in any way damage them before you put them yeah in the mm -hmm. yeah I do I also think it's really easy to complicate that stuff. Like you can find like ratios and mm -hmm. you don't even have to look at that. Like you just kind of kill a jar with herbs, fill it with alcohol. Yeah. And it's <laughs> Fresh. Fresh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so a lot of people brought up a lot of um, sort of questions that they have about a lot of things. Um, I was thinking we could like maybe talk to the group of people around you about maybe solutions to those things or um, if there was someone in the room who knows a lot about something that you were wondering about, you could um, approach them. Um, so some of the topics were solar drying, um, drying and canning meat, um, <coughs> storing produce in produce cellars, um, and concerns with white mold and um, ethylene, as, and then um, fermentation, cheese making, and then like what we talked about, with vinegar and tinctures. So, yeah, if you guys just want to talk about, um, talk to people around you, and um, that'd be great. what each group was saying and, and if you had any um, recipes to share or tips or, or you know any takeaways from your group to, to share with the rest of us um, that would be really excellent so um, starting on this side of the room this time I'm not sure where the groups were distinguished but um, this corner of people we just got to some. know each other so oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we were talking about cheese making, so it's our discussion 
Thanks. Oh, we both realized we would love to learn more about mushroom preservation. So if anybody has done any of that, you should come talk to us. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Joe told me I could use hydrogen peroxide to slow down the mold in my root cellar. Um, one thing I didn't, and we had a nice bit about root cellars. One thing that, I don't know, I just stumbled onto this by accident, but my root cellar is near um, another building, a lot of rain comes off the roof, and I've had to put a, a um, sub pump in it to keep the excess water out, but the humidity is extremely high and my potatoes will last till July, till the new potatoes come. Wow. And so will the carrots. Wow. And um, yeah. so it's really, uh, I'm, I'm, three, I'm 10 feet below the ground with a three foot uh, soil cover. It's all cement except for the floor. It's very important, the floor is dirt, although I put gravel in so I didn't track in mud for my wife. Um, <laughs> let's see. And um, <coughs> the um, high humidity and the, and the temperature range, when I put the potatoes in will be around 40, six or so in October and I'll go down to about 35 in January and February and then by the time July comes when I'm emptying the green or the root cellar it's back up in the 40s. Mm -hmm. So that's the curve. Usually I have to sprout them twice to get to July. Mm -hmm. And does that mean you're you're breaking off I'm just the breaking eyes. off the sprouts. Oh, okay. yeah. So anytime about community things or grandkids, this is a great that's great. important. They'll go soft uh -huh. if you don't sprout them. Oh, okay. If you, you say sprout them, you need to break off them. Yeah, I just break off the sprouts. And mm -hmm. So, well, if you don't have a root cellar, how do you, what's the best way to keep potatoes for? Well, they, they like it cool potatoes. and a little bit damp, not extreme, but dark. they're not refrigerated. Right. You can't, you shouldn't put them in the refrigerator, though. Starch will start to turn the sugar a little bit. Find a place in the house. Is yeah, in the basement. If you have a basement, mm -hmm. or or a, a wall of your garage that's next to the house where it doesn't freeze, mm -hmm. they can't freeze. And they don't freeze, I should say. Mm -hmm. so they can freeze, <laughs> but you don't want them to freeze. Yeah. <laughs> Group in the back. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, like making hard cider and how mm -hmm. to avoid contamination with that. Mm -hmm. uh, where to send extra apples if you have a really big harvest year. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, mostly just to kind of get into it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, folks up <laughs> <laughs> uh, We kept it a little more abstract. I guess some of us were coming from the session that was in this room right before where we were talking mm -hmm. about statewide food plans and so we were just thinking like in a state like Montana if the goal is to go to head toward more of a self-sufficient system you have a three maybe four month growing season and like this processing is going to be really important and how do you make that happen to to preserve that food for the remaining eight months of the year and we had no answers to that problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. yeah. we talked yeah. about the importance of the institutional market mm -hmm. in playing ball with this and the yeah. opportunity that exists in the commercial kitchens that, it, that are embedded in every community in the school district and the timing of the institutional kitchens functioning during the school year and how there is that gap at the, mm -hmm. in the summer where it could be utilized for processing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it has a couple of interesting solutions there. One, you're providing year-round employment mm -hmm. for employees who are part of the that institutional kitchen. You have a commercially certified kitchen embedded in the community already. Mm -hmm. And there is community autonomy around every school district. So you're, I appreciate your concern about, you know, we don't want a, a one-size-fits-all for how every community should do it. But mm -hmm. if they, the school is a, is a hub of, um, Kind of the heartbeat of that community so yeah how are we using yeah. that optimally and they're kind of having their their own gardens more and more right in missoula there's a tool library right. and with tools encompass things like cider presses and you know, some food related stuff as mm -hmm. well as how much it drills and, um, and thinking in terms of food security the ongoing for um, the, the more urban areas, and the two libraries might be something that could be done in other towns mm -hmm. too. I mean, I don't know what other ones exist in, in Montana, but 
the one in Missoula is really useful. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I don't think they do have, I mean, it's mostly like construction tools and maybe they've got garden mm -hmm. kettles. Do they? They've got apple cider presses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've got sewing machines, lawnmowers, wow. concrete mixers. Okay. They've got, it's all online. Mm -hmm. And you go to mudproject.org. Mm -hmm. oh. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I think that can often be a barrier to like getting the equipment just to do the activities. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, the, the, I know the mud projects. But how yeah, do you know how they fund it? Pardon? Do you know how they fund it or do you pay um, Memberships. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, and if it's on a sliding scale, so depending on your income. So I think the base membership is $35 a year. Oh, yeah. And they, you know, they're always, they're like a nonprofit, so they're always soliciting funds and they have fundraisers and <coughs> various things. Have a good party once a year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <coughs> folks over here? We talked about kombucha and sourdough and just kind of our thoughts and ideas around that. And um, I'll try to let you yeah. Dara moved from New York, and she is saying that when she is doing sauerkraut, it the humidity and just like the elevation change, like kind mm -hmm. of plays a huge part in that. Ruined it. So I don't know if you want to, yeah. Yeah, it's just like different elevations and humidity. It's been discouraging in my experience because oh. <laughs> I had a recipe that I love, and then oh. now my fermentation is off. But. Mm -hmm. You need a Montana recipe. Yeah, I'm so about to talk to some of you guys. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Yeah, we just talked and got to know each other. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to add on about the tool library. Portland does have like a kitchen lending program, so I think that would be like a similar thing. And I'm just really inspired by everyone's like, I see like a need for more community socializing in general in different places and I see like okay people want to preserve food it goes well doing it together so I just see like a huge opportunity and just community based like um, sovereignty kind of things mm -hmm. and I think that also kind of addresses people's different capacities so like we were talking about how there's all these different limiting factors that you guys have brought up like you know who has the storage who has the time mm -hmm. um, you know what your what your different limiting factors are for for getting involved in food preservation you said you don't have electricity right. and so to get together with people to do it you know together can can um, you kind of share the, the success and the resources yeah, yeah to, to limit to get rid of those limitations yeah, yeah. I just wanted to point out too that the intergenerational aspect of food storage is really wonderful you can get with your elders who remember what their grandparents taught them and indigenous peoples too have different methods that we haven't perhaps explored that's yeah, a really don't good point. can with wax on the top why don't you like paraffin what's it leaks mm. it's yeah. all my mother did for all I our jams you yeah. betcha and that's one of the dangers of using your elders <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, I, one resource I've found is um, like old cookbooks. I really love to collect old cookbooks. And I was telling my mom, like, oh, this one from 1920 or whatever has a canning section, so I need that one. And she said, be careful. <laughs> She's like, there's some old techniques that are that are being modernized, I guess. Or um, so yeah. So I, I mean, I love your intergenerational considered. You know. Yeah, a lot of bad ideas came out of the 20s. <laughs> <laughs> which ties directly to a question I had back here that I think uh -huh. I mentioned, which is, you know, growing up, I was very drawn to the Cumberland catalog. I don't know if anybody remembers that old catalog with all these ancient tools for grinding and mm -hmm. making butter and the whole nine yards. But um, because of that, I was given a couple different books along the road, like stocking up. People saw my obsession with this part of my life. What are the resources people in this room turn to aside from each other, either online or in terms of books, for like a go-to, if anybody has any? More specifically, does anybody have a really awesome fermentation or preservation cookbook? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's the art of fermentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my favorite one. Yeah. It has everything. I can't remember his name. And it's uh, Sandor Sandor Tass. Tass. Yes. Yeah. And you wrote wild fermentation as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent book. Can you it, say all those again? Because we're not here. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Will you say that? I don't remember the author's name. His name? Oh, Sandor Katz. K 
K-A-T-Z. And he's all, like his wild fermentation book, like he won't give you any measurements. It's all just like, we've been doing this forever without measuring cups, like just go do it. So it's good and bad sometimes. <laughs> well, the art of fermentation does have specific recipes with some measurements, but he spends chapters talking about you know, just the concept of making sauerkraut or sourdough bread or um, things like that. So, yeah, these are wonderful. Um, I always turn to the um, uh, ex, uh, Ag Extension websites. Yeah. So MSU and, and Iowa State University, I think, they have great information. Yeah. Um, and ball canning, the blue book, is yeah. sort of the Bible of canning. And it's got thousands of recipes. Yeah. And if you're really concerned about like botulism and food safety with like canning, like the USDA has a lot of um, information on like research-based rules about what you should do for canning. It takes a lot of those that concern me. <laughs> so uh, there are these people in Oregon called the Shockleys, and they just wrote a book called Miso, Tempeh, Natto, and Other Tasty Ferments, a step-by-step -step guide to fermenting grains and beans. So if you're interested in that aspect, that's probably a good resource. If you're looking for supplies, try to go beyond Amazon. Amazon's always first on the list, and I don't know, like to support them too much. But I found in, in looking for the fermentation jugs that the airtight seal, or the water seals, I found a place in Ohio that had the same jugs at almost half the price of Amazon. Um, and um, I really like to support local even though Ohio is not local. It's more local than Amazon. So it's just look around a little bit. Do you remember the name of that company? I don't know, but I can get it for you. Okay. Yeah. I use Bozeman <laughs> Buy Sell Trade a lot, and we'll just be like, who has jars that I can buy? And I think that that's a great resource as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of different mm -hmm. communities have pages like mm -hmm. that, I think. Yeah, those... Uh, the crocs for sauerkraut are really expensive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've tried to sell fine crocs on that page and have not been successful yet, but one day they'll pop up. <laughs> so mine were four gallons for about 80, 85 bucks a piece, and then was on there 150. Wow. So, but they're, they're and, and the three gallons, they have three and four. Four is getting a little bit heavy when you fill up a little sauerkraut. Yeah. Thank you all so much for your awesome ideas and questions. and. And I, I felt like this was a really good space to share. So you know, please continue to network and, and uh, enjoy the last session. Thank you.